I've owned the Mamiya C220 for a few years now and I've always enjoyed shooting with it. But for this video, I've done a serious deep dive into all the different features of this camera and I've gotta tell ya, I'm pretty impressed with its engineering and all the things it can do. So if you're interested in how these kinds of cameras work or just this one specifically, let's dive in. The Mamiya C220 is what's called a twin lens reflex medium format film camera. It's called twin lens because as you can see, it has two lenses. The top lens is used for the viewfinder to compose and focus your image, while the bottom lens is used to actually expose the film to light. Now this is different from, say, what's called a SLR or single lens reflex. This is where a single lens is used both for the viewfinder and to expose the film to light, and it does this by utilizing this mirror. When the mirror is down, it bounces the light up into the viewfinder, and to take a photo, the mirror will move up out of the way and allow the camera to expose the film. So this is a roll of medium format black and white film. It's a larger format than 35 millimeter, which means you basically get better resolution, so to speak. The same image is being projected onto a larger surface and thus more information is recorded. The film is rolled around a spool with a paper backing. And here are some examples of what it looks like on my light table when it's already developed, both black and white and color and some slide film. If I open up the back of the camera here, you can see the part where the film will sit and it's a square format, which is called six by six. And there you can see the back of the bottom lens which exposes the film to light. On the top of the camera is a focusing screen with a hood to make it easier to see. But for right now, I'm going to remove the hood so that we can just see the bare screen itself, which is right here. So when composing your photograph, you would turn these knobs here to focus the lens and allow you to focus it on the screen here. Now, as you can see, it's not very easy to see what's actually on the screen, which is why you have this hood. So if I put the hood back on, it's very easy to pop it up. I just lift this up. Uh, light is being blocked from the screen, so it's a little bit easier to see. And to make it even easier, I can push in here and pop up this little magnifying glass which makes it very easy to see exactly what's in focus. The shutter and the aperture for this camera are located entirely inside the lens. So that makes the rest of the camera sort of a fancy box for holding the film. On the side here, you can see dials to adjust your shutter speed and your aperture. One really cool thing about this camera is that it has interchangeable lenses. So I can take this lens off and put on a lens of a different focal length. Here on the side, we can see some of the lenses available, 55 millimeter, 65, 80, 105, 135, 180, and 250 millimeter. The camera is also somewhat idiot proof in that it tries to help prevent you from removing the lens accidentally uh, and exposing the film inside to light when you don't mean to. So if you actually look right here, there's this little metal piece that is in the way of me moving this lever. And that will stay there until all the conditions are met in order to safely remove the lens. So one of the main things you'll do is you'll turn this knob here. And this does a couple things. There's a baffle inside, which we'll see in a second, that helps block light from hitting the film when you remove the lens. And there's also a marker inside the viewfinder that is a reminder that, hey, the baffle's down. So you can see this other little metal piece here popped out. And right now I can't remove the lens. It wants me to move all the way back and that little metal piece pushes this up out of the way and now I can move this lever and take the lens off. So here with the lens off we can see a couple things. We can see the actual physical baffle which I can actually show you through the back of the camera as well. So you can see here it's risen up so it's blocking the light from hitting the film which would be sitting right here. If I turn this again you can see it moves the baffle <laughs> very quickly to close uh, and make it light tight. So in the top lens here, you can see there's actually a mirror, which is at a 45 degree angle. So the light will come in and then bounce up into the focusing screen. And there's a red marker as a reminder. It's basically an arm that sits there and it flips back when I open the baffle. And then when I close the baffle, It'll flip in the way just as a reminder, hey, baffle's still closed, so you need to open it in order to take a photo. Now, obviously, if you open the baffle like this, 
with film in there, it would be exposed and ruined. So now I can take another lens, which has both a front lens cap and a rear lens cap. Position on the camera and then lock it into place. So the Mamiya C220 takes medium format film, either 120 or 220. This right here is 120, and it's unlikely that you'll be shooting with 220, but maybe you'll, you'll get your hands in a roll and you wanna try it out. So for loading the film, the first thing you wanna do is make sure this switch right here is on the correct format of film, either 120 or 220, so you can switch it back and forth. What this does is it changes how the counter works, which this is telling you which photo you're on. And if it's on 120, it will go to 12 photos, and then it will unlock this uh, advanced wheel right here, allowing you to completely roll the rest of the film and the paper backing onto the take-up spool. And if you do 220, like that, the counter will go to 24 because it is twice as long as a 120 roll of film and then allow you to do that same thing. So I'm going to set it to 120 because that's the type of film we're going to use. And then I'm going to open up the back of the camera. You do that with this switch right here. And if you look, there's a little red dot. So what you need to do is turn this so the little red dot is all the way at the top. And then there's an arrow here indicating you move it to the right and that will open up the back of the camera. On the back of the door of the camera, you'll see what's called a pressure plate. And a pressure plate is literally just a plate that keeps pressure on the film as it sits in front of the lens. This makes sure that the distance between the lens and the film is correct. So here you can see it says 120 and 220 with a little red dot. So if you are shooting 220 film, you turn it like this and it will slightly change uh, the amount of pressure put on the film because 220 is a little bit longer and I believe a little bit thinner. So it needs a slightly different position relative to the lens. Otherwise, it will come out with blurry photos. So I wanna make sure to set this to 120. And then you'll also see on the back here, it'll indicate 120. So before you load your film, you wanna make sure that you have an empty take-up spool to put in the top here. Another interesting thing about the camera is that the take-up spool actually acts as part of the mechanism of the camera. Because if I turn this wheel right here, all it does is just turn these teeth. That's the only thing it does. But with the take-up spool in, it activates this gear right here and will actually advance the counter on the camera. If you look here, you can see a yellow indicator, which indicates the direction that the teeth are facing that go into these holes on either end of the take-up spool. So that way you can tell the orientation of the teeth as you're loading the spool in there to try to make it a little bit easier. You can then lift up this knob here and put it back and now you're ready to go. So next I can take the wrapping off of my 120 film and you'll see this tab at the end and the tab has a hole in it. In the center of the take-up spool, there's a slot and within that slot is actually a little catch, a little piece of plastic that will catch onto that hole. So I'll load the film spool on the bottom here, pulling this out and then advancing the tab forward and then inserting it into the slot in the middle of the take-up spool. Then I'll turn the advanced knob here. And whenever you're loading medium format film on really any camera, you want to put a little bit of tension on the edge here using your thumb. The purpose being to make the film a little bit taut so it's adhering cleanly to the back of the camera. So then I advance it until the start arrows are lined up with these two red markings right here. At this point, I can close the back of the camera, snap it shut, and then you want to make sure to turn this wheel all the way 90 degrees to the left. That way it will stay locked and you won't accidentally bump it open. You'll notice that your counter reads zero. So then you can take your advance wheel here and this will advance the film all the way until it's ready to take picture number one. So to actually take a photo with the camera, the first thing you need to do is meter 
for the light. Now, this camera does not use any kind of batteries. It's totally mechanical and it does not include a light meter. So you'll need to use a handheld light meter, which this is the one I use. It's an older Polaris light meter that happens to have a five degree spot meter on it. You can also use the spot meter function on your DSLR if you have one, or if you're in a pinch, there are light meter apps you can use on your smartphone. You wanna keep the ISO of your film in mind, of course, and make sure that your light meter is set to the same ISO as your film. Once you get your shutter and aperture readings, you'll change them here on the lens. Different lenses will have different aperture and shutter capabilities. So this lens, which is the 80 millimeter, uh, has one 500th of a second all the way down to one full second, and then B for bulb mode, meaning as long as you hold down the shutter button, the shutter will stay open. Also, this one opens up to a maximum f-stop of f2.8 and goes all the way to f32. So next you'll want to compose your photo, and you gotta keep in mind that because it's just a simple single mirror at a 45 degree angle in the viewfinder, that up and down, moving the camera up and down will remain the same, but left and right will be reversed. Also keep in mind that any lettering or numbering will also appear reversed in the viewfinder. It can take a little getting used to in order to compose the photo. There are different viewfinders, assuming you can find them, that you can place on top of the camera. Uh, one of them is a prism finder that will correct the backwardsness of the view that you see. Another is one that actually has a light meter built into the finder itself, so you don't need to use a separate viewfinder. On the side of the camera here are your focusing distances. So here we have red in feet and meters in black. And then as I extend out the focusing, you'll see 80 millimeters, 65 and 55, and then these different colored lines. So 55 is in blue, 65 is in red, and 80 is in black. And these lines generally correspond to the distance you're focused at. So if I'm shooting with an 80 millimeter, which I have on now, and I focus here, that means I'm focused at about four and a half feet. Now, as I extend this out, you can see the lines for other lenses, which are also color coded. There are two different 105 millimeters, a 135, a 180, and a 250, and they're all color coded. So you can see here the 250, for example, maximum all the way out, the focusing distance is about seven feet. And for the 180 millimeter, it's about four feet. There is actually another way to compose your photo, and that's with the sports finder which if I push this in, it does pop up this magnifier here, but if I push it all the way down, you can see this other hole in the back. So the idea is that you look through this hole, through the front here, and that is your sports finder, the ability to look quickly at your subject and move the camera at some fast moving object. It seems a little impractical, but the feature is there. Also, you'll see these two pegs, and I don't have any of these, but there are different screens, essentially, or frames that you can snap onto these pegs that will give you a general framing depending on what lens you're using. So in order to flip the sports finder back up, you can just push on the side here. So now that your photo is composed, you can prime the shutter by moving this lever right here. So now the shutter is spring loaded, ready to go. The actual lever that moves the shutter is right here. But if you push that by itself, it will fire the shutter, but then it won't let you advance the film because this whole mechanism right here didn't move. So normally to actually fire the shutter, you'll just press down right here. Once you fire the shutter, you can flip this out here and this will advance the film. And here you can see it's advanced to the next frame. Now another thing you can do is use what's called a remote release cord, which is where you push this plunger down and this comes out like this. And this is what I often do with this camera and it attaches right here, you just screw it in and then you can prime your shutter. And so let's say you've taken a photo, but you'd like to do a multiple exposure where you expose the same piece of film again, a second time, or maybe even a third or fourth. That's what this knob is for. When it's on single, it allows you to take a single photograph and won't allow you to fire the shutter again until the film is advanced. But if I turn it to multi, that allows me to prime the shutter again and be able to take as many photos on this same piece of film as I want. As strange as it may sound, the Mamiya C220 actually has the ability 
to take some great macro photos onto medium format film. And I can do this because of the incredibly large distance that allows you to move the lens out from the body. And it allows this because of this fabric bellows right here. Now I only own the 55 millimeter and the 80 millimeter lenses. So I've tested those and their closest focusing distances are three and a half inches for the 55 and seven and a half inches for the 80. So this makes the 55 millimeter lens a much better candidate for taking macro photos. So at the bottom here are what are called exposure factors. These exposure factors are to compensate for having the lens move out further and the distance between the lens and the film is increasing. Therefore, the amount of light that's being transmitted uh, through the lens to the film decreases. So to compensate for how much you're moving the lens out, you have to increase the exposure by one of these factors depending on what your focus level is. So for example, I'm using a 55 millimeter lens and if I put it say in this position at the bottom, goes one, 1.5, and then right now it's in two. So that means my exposure factor is two, meaning whatever my exposure is, or the settings for my aperture and shutter speed, I have to double that. I have to double the amount of light coming into the camera, otherwise the exposure uh, won't be correct. So for example, if I'm using f4.5 uh, at one eighth of a second, I can double that exposure by simply setting the shutter speed to one fourth of a second. Doubles the amount of time and thus doubles the amount of light coming into the camera. Now you're probably wondering, okay, well, if I'm going to be taking macro shots of something like this Pentax point and shoot camera I have here as my subject, I'm gonna be composing and focusing with the top lens in the viewfinder, but actually taking the photo with the bottom lens. And so if I max this out in terms of focusing distance, you can see if I just keep the camera in this position, I'm not really going to be taking a photo of my subject. Now the camera has a couple ways to help you compensate for this parallax. The first way is that if you're maybe doing handheld shooting uh, is some markers on the focusing screen. There are two lines. The top line you see is if your exposure factor is at 1.5. This line basically means that if that's where your focusing is when you focus on your subject and at your current distance, then everything below that line will be in the photo and everything above it will not be. The next line down is if your exposure factor is at two. So if you've got your distance, you focus on your subject and the side here says your exposure factor is two and everything below this line should be in the photo and above it will not be in the photo. And then you can draw an imaginary line through the middle of the focusing screen if your exposure factor is three. So everything above the middle will not be in the photo and everything below it will be. Now for a situation like this where I want to maximize the amount of magnification I can get out of this lens, what I would do is I would put the bellows out all the way like this and then I would move the camera itself back and forth in order to get uh, the item here in focus. Now you can use what's called a macro focusing rail or in this case I can just move the tripod back and forth just in tiny increments and probably get a pretty good focus. Now once the item I'm trying to photograph is in focus, I need to move my camera and this is really important. There's actually an accessory that, I don't know if you can find one, but it's called a paramender. And essentially what it is, is a shaft that goes up and down to move the camera up and down. So what I can do is just raise the neck of this tripod so that the bottom lens is actually lined up with the subject and then go ahead and take my photo. Now what's important to remember about doing this is that if my camera is tilted like this and I'm focusing on a subject, that's a certain distance away. If I then raise the camera, so the bottom lens is in that same position, technically that lens is slightly further away than the top lens was and so the focusing will be off. So the camera itself has to be perpendicular, straight up and down. A nice thing about this camera is that the shutter is actually a leaf shutter. So instead of using uh, rectangular curtains to go back and forth, it has a, a leaf uh, petals essentially that all open up at once. And what's nice about that is you can use flash with this camera at any of its shutter speeds. So to use flash, the camera has a couple things on it, including this cold shoe here. And this is a cold shoe. It doesn't activate any flash. It's just there to hold a flash. And then on the lens itself is what's called a PC sync port, which is the closest thing to a universal 
support back in the film days for syncing your flash with the camera shutter going off. So you would attach a physical cord here that would then run to your flash, either here or off camera. Now, one other thing that's important is this switch right back here. I know it looks like it says Sigma Chi, but that's actually X and M. So you want this to be on X. And the reason why is because X means you're using uh, an electronic flash, whereas M refers to an older style of a flash bulb that would go off about 20 milliseconds slower than what an electronic flash would do. So switching it to M allows the shutter and an M class uh, flash bulb to sync. But since those aren't used anymore, you would just keep it on X. The camera does have a standard quarter inch tripod mount and alongside of it are some holes which allow some accessories like different grips like a pistol grip and a side grip which you can get if you can find them uh, to keep them from swiveling uh, around the bottom. So assuming you're shooting with 120 film you'll have 12 exposures on that roll so when you hit 12 you'll see the red number 12 here and you can take your last photo and then once you do you'll be turning this all the way until you hear the paper backing and you'll be able to feel it a little bit too uh, come completely on to the take-up spool. So you then turn this clockwise, 90 degrees, slide it sideways, and open it up. And I don't have a full roll in here, but if I did, then I would pop this out like this. And then the film will come with a little sticky bit like this paper here that allows you to secure the film. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and if so, I'd love to get a thumbs up, a like. Uh, if you'd like to subscribe for more film photography videos, that'd be awesome. And if you'd like to leave a comment, if you have any questions, uh, just let me know. Thanks a lot.